Good morning and welcome to Home Retreats. My name is Father Chad. This last fortnight has been a wonderful time for all sorts of different saints. St. Dominic, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, St. Lawrence, St. Clair, St. Jane de Chantal, Maximilian Kolbe and tomorrow Bernard. And it's made me reflect on how we understand holiness. In some ways, holy can be rather a derogatory word these days, holier than thou, and to be called a holy Joe isn't exactly a compliment. What does that word holy mean to you? Is it essentially a negative word, the absence of something, the absence of sin, or is it a positive word being full of grace? Do the words unstained, untainted, spotless, immaculate, are those the words that resonate with you when you think about holiness? My concern, I suppose, is that if holiness becomes simply a negative word, we can end up a bit like the man in the parable who buries his talent out of fear and simply returns what he was given. As though holiness is something like our front garden that we have to defend and guard and maintain in the sight of everyone else. When I was training to be a house parent at the school here, um, I was put in a group of single teachers to look at what's the role of a house parent. And the single most important thing the rest of the group all agreed was safety. That was their main priority was simply to keep the children safe. Is that the same of our spiritual lives? When we come to look at Mary, we think of someone who is both virgin and mother. And therefore, when we call her immaculate, that's not the end of the story. We don't venerate Mary simply as virgin, but as the virgin who became the mother of God. Turning away from sin is not simply to remain unstained, but is in order to bear fruit, to enable growth. There are other negative words which, again, leave me rather cold. That word, immortal. Resurrection seems to me is not simply the avoidance of death. Jesus was not immortal. We go through death to the life beyond. And so I don't want to be immortal. Similarly, infinite and endless. Do we define heaven by what it doesn't have? An end, a border? If so, it's not surprising that people can come to think of heaven as rather boring. What is the positive quality of life in the kingdom? Something that we can begin to taste now. What do we mean by holiness? If we go back to the time of Jesus, there were all sorts of differing views as to what it meant to be holy. The zealots thought that Israel could be a holy nation if they could simply get rid of the Romans. The Essenes down in Qumran, in their communities by the Dead Sea, thought they could be a holy community if they could keep out darkness. The priests in Jerusalem thought that they could be a holy temple if they could simply keep out the Gentiles. And the Pharisees thought they could be holy individuals if they could distance themselves from the sinners. In all these cases, we come to see holiness as defining ourselves over against someone else. I am holy, they are not. We know what we want to be free from, like those Reformation Puritans who knew what they didn't want. They could almost smell Catholicism, popery, how to get rid of it. Those who want to purify themselves today through their diets, through purifying our history of all the wrong statues, through purifying our money, through getting rid of unethical investments. Any policy of zero tolerance, getting rid of somehow what contaminates us, can lead to simply a negative view. I suppose that its most demonic expression was the Nazi desire to eradicate Jewish contamination.
at a more day-to-day -day individual level, sometimes confession seems to me people wanting to get rid of that psychic stain, to be cleansed from that feeling of guilt, to be free from that. But what is holiness free for? What are we trying to build? In confession, is there a desire for the future to be different? for us to be healed and restored to fullness of life. So it seems to me there are two camps, those who rail against too much language of sin and who want to emphasize original blessing, and those who complain about too much talk of cheap mercy and want to emphasize original sin. What did, what did Jesus mean by holiness? The parable of the wheat and the darnel seems to me to emphasize the illusion of purity. The wheat and the darnel grow up together. And Jesus warns about the obsession of weeding out the darnel. Instead, I think he wants us to concentrate on that wheat which is growing. And so the language of holiness, which sees it as being fulfilled, whole, fruitful, complete. Does that resonate with you? Mary, who is full of grace. Creation in all its positivity. Holiness doesn't bypass our created nature, it fulfills it. Perfecting it not completely now, but beginning that process to be completed in heaven. As Thomas Aquinas said, grace does not destroy nature, but fulfills its potential. I think that's why the early church rejected the, th the teaching of Manichae, who saw that matter was it inherently evil. If we accept and embrace this more positive view of holiness, we can see that any desire for holiness is not simply to keep us static, defensive, but is to encourage us. As St. Benedict says at the end of the prologue, as we progress in this way of life and in faith, our hearts will expand to recognise and embrace all that is good. As the founder of the Quakers, George Fox, put it, to see that of God in every man. It seems to me that Jesus' parables and the incarnation itself remind us of the importance of that horizontal dimension of loving your neighbour, which will inevitably involve risk and sometimes failure. As Tennyson famously said, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Now, of course, there are dangers with this approach. We can end up at the other extreme of simply pursuing a sort of pleasure, a sort of hedonism, materialism. We simply follow our own desires. Not so much the word became flesh, but our flesh becomes the word for us. At an Easter talk, I quoted something from an old father here who I first got to know at the beginning of my time here, Father Columba Carrielwes, who said at the Reformation, people abandoned the church to hold on to Christ. At the Enlightenment, they abandoned Christ to hold on to their reason. And in the 20th century, they abandoned their reason to hold on to their desires. And so what we end up with is simply holding on to our desires. And so perhaps sometimes in order to seek life, to grow, to be fulfilled, we can end up getting carried away with a sort of unhealthy or imbalanced growth. At best, a sense of contentment that leads to complacency. At worst, a pride that leads to arrogance. And Jesus tells us in the gospel of the parable of the vine of our need for pruning. I think precisely because we are creatures, we need guidance and doubly so as creatures who are weakened by the consequences of our predecessors' sins. And so all those prohibitions in the scriptures warn us of the consequences of falling away from the path of holiness if we lie, if we steal.
But even with all those dangers, what is this positive quality of holiness? Have you met those you consider to be holy? Is it the quality of their moral lives, their uprightness, their integrity? Is it the quality of their religious lives, their fidelity to the church? Is it the quality of their spiritual lives, their prayer? They seem to be on the border between two worlds. Their very presence, their way of speaking and listening and responding. When you see them praying, does that make holiness a sort of maverick quality, an eccentric quality? Something perhaps in the world's eyes not always fully sane and balanced. Benedict as a hermit was mistaken for a wild animal. Francis was seen as deranged, Bernadette as unhinged. These are the marginal figures, in Jung's language, the liminal figures, the intermediate ones bridging different worlds. I can understand that approach, but I think there is a danger here that we forget that we are all called to holiness. Holiness is not simply otherworldliness, a sort of numinous aura. The teaching of the Second Vatican Council reminds us the forms and tasks of life are many, but holiness is one. That sanctity which is cultivated by all who act under God's spirit and follow Christ. If holiness is a vocation for all, then it must be something incarnate. Saints are those who live ordinary lives well. And I think that's an important corrective to the whole heroic model of being a saint. George Herbert's line, who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that and the action fine. If holiness is for all, it cannot simply be one ideal against which we are all measured so that we end up judging others as more or less holy. Everyone's holiness is different. If grace works through nature, then that leads to a wonderful variety of saints and individuals. So what is our role? Should we try to be holy? I think there is a parallel here with humour and humility. In all these three cases, humour, humility and holiness, if we try too hard, it can be counterproductive. It's not something self-conscious. It's a byproduct of other things being in place. Real humour flows from observing the ridiculousness of the world. Real humility flows from knowing our place in creation. Real holiness flows from recognising that we are more than we think. In other words, humour is realising we are too serious. Humility that we are too pretentious. And holiness that we are too cautious. So what then do we need to get right in the first place? If we are called to holiness, it is a response to the God who calls us. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And it is that God who reveals his holiness often through those around us. As Thomas Merton says, the saints are glad to be saints, not because their sanctity makes them admirable to others, but because the gift of sanctity makes it possible for them to admire others. So what does holiness mean in practice? I think of parents juggling the demands of work and family and friendships and themselves, but who still look out for and respond to and pray for their children rather than simply themselves. I think of those living alone who sustain their parish, their community, their network. Holiness cannot simply be, if I do yoga, I'll be a more successful banker. St. Benedict says, your way of acting must be different from the world's way. Holiness must be 
a transcending of our own agenda, a breaking out from that self-preoccupation. Uh, it's a perspective which sees beyond simply the here and now, not bypassing it, but orientating it towards the eternal kingdom. At the Mass, when we sing both the Sanctus and the Benedictus, I'm struck by the progression between those two. In the Sanctus, we have holiness as something awesome, terrifying, separate, other. Isaiah saying, woe is me. In the Benedictus, we move on to the God among us, that scandalous reality of the word made flesh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. No longer separate, terrifying, ter awesome, but someone to be loved followed. In his chapter on humility, Benedict says the final step is where the monk, no longer out of fear of hell, but out of love for Christ, good habit and delight in virtue, observes all these steps of humility naturally. I don't think this is complacency. I think it is gratitude, intimacy and communion. That movement from Moses saying, keep away from the holy mountain, to Jesus saying, take and eat. One final thought. It is the church together that is holy. Not just one group, monks, any religious, establishing the pattern of holiness for others simply to follow nor the laity rejecting the whole tradition of difference from the world. I've often been struck that monks can learn from married people that holiness does not bypass human relationships. And that married people can learn from monks that holiness needs that broader context, that bigger picture. So in conclusion, don't become hung up on holiness. St. Benedict, with a smile, I think, reminds us, do not seek to be called holy before you really are. But if we truly want the will of God, if we truly live out that gospel, then holiness will flow. And so may God bless you all this day, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.